reading through the Bible in one year, February 26th, Exodus chapter 9, Luke chapter 12, Job 27, and 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Come to Pharaoh and speak to him. Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them, behold, the hand of Yahweh will come with a very heavy pestilence on your livestock which are in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the herds, and on the flocks. But Yahweh will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. Yahweh also set a definite time, saying, Tomorrow Yahweh will do this thing in the land. So Yahweh did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the sons of Israel, no one died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not even one of the livestock of Israel dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened with firmness, and he did not let the people go. Now you might be saying to yourself, How is it that a sovereign God has to ask permission from this king of Egypt, this emperor of Egypt? How is it that he has to ask permission? Well, clearly this shows that God is just a gentleman. He's not going to do anything without somebody uh, first saying that it's okay first. Um, Absolutely not. In fact, we'll later read where um, God in a single night kills 186,000 people. We've seen through all the plagues thus far, and there's still more to come, where God has caused horrible things to happen within the land to all the people of Egypt. It's only been in the last few that he's made it so that these things don't impact the Israelites. We see these things happening quite a bit within Scripture. It's not that God needs to ask permission. In fact, he isn't asking permission at all. He's commanding him to let his people go. But he's allowing him to um, not follow along with the command of God. To make a spectacle of these things. You can see that the point is pretty clear. What God is doing and, and we'll see this as we go through the rest of the Old Testament. That this is becoming a keystone moment for the Israelite people. They will forever look back on this and remember the time that God did all of these plagues to the king of Egypt and to all the people in Egypt. It was a massive spectacle that the entire world at that time saw taking place. And they spoke of it for generations to come. It wasn't just this, it's also how God continued to defend them. He takes care of them, provides them water, provides them food, allowed them to cross through a sea with wall of water on either side of them, walking straight through on dry land. This is what God has done for his people. So he's telling this king, who he is preventing from allowing his people to go, but he's making it seem like it's his decision that he's relying on this guy to kind of make up his own mind. I'm sure on Pharaoh's mind, he was thinking, well, if he was really a God, he could just take them. We'll see what happens. Verse eight. Then Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, take for yourselves handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses toss it toward the sky in inside of Pharaoh. And it will become fine dust over all the land of Egypt. And it will become boils breaking out with sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses tossed it toward the sky. And the boils, it became boils breaking out with sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Pharaoh because of the boils. For the boils were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians. And Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart with strength, and he did not listen to them, just as Yahweh had spoken to Moses. 
And Yahweh said to to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh, and you shall say to him, Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues against your heart and amongst your servants and your people, so that they may not, uh, rather, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For if by now I had sent forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would then have been wiped out from the earth. But indeed, for this reason, I have caused you to stand in order to show my rather to show you my power and in order to recount my name throughout all the earth. Still, you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will rain down down very heavy hail, such as has not been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. So now, send, bring your livestock and whatever you have left in the field to safety. Every man and every beast that is found in the field and is not brought home, the hail will come down on them and they will die. The one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of Yahweh made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. But he who did not consider um, in his heart the word of Yahweh left his servants and his livestock in the field. Now Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be hail on all the land of Egypt, on man and on beast and on every plant of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. So Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, and Yahweh gave forth thunder and hail, and fire went down to the earth, and Yahweh rained down hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy, such as has not been seen in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck all that was in the field through all the land of Egypt, from a man to beast. The hail also struck down every plant in the field and shattered every tree in the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. Yahweh is the righteous one, and I and my people are the wicked ones. Entreat Yahweh, for God's thunder and hail are too much, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. And Moses said to him, As soon as I go out of the city, I will spread out my hands to Yahweh. The thunder will cease, and there will be no hail any longer, that you may know that the earth is Yahweh's. But as for you and your servants, I know you do not yet fear Yahweh God. Now the flax and the barley were struck down, for the barley was in the ear, and the um, flax was in bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck down, for they are late ripening. And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to Yahweh. And the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured on the earth. But Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased. So he sinned again and hardened his heart with firmness, he and his servants. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened with strength, and he did not let the sons of Israel go, just as Yahweh had spoken by the hand of Moses. Move on now to Luke chapter 12. At this time, after so many thousands of the crowd had gathered together that they were trampling on one another, he began saying to his disciples first, again, not just the twelve, it's all the people who are following him, Be on your guard for the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. Whatever you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. But I say to you, my friends, do not fear those who will kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you the one whom to fear. Fear the one whom, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two asaria? Yet not one of them is is forgotten before God. 
Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. I tell my wife that all the time. And I say to you, everyone who, conf- uh, who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, well, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. Now, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or or what you are to say. The Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? This is the same thing Moses said. This is calling back to that. This is the same thing, rather, that it was said to Moses. Then he said to them, Watch out and be on your guard against every form of greed, which is what that really was about. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, "Ah, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you prepared? So is the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said to his disciples, For this very reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, and they have no storeroom or barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? In which of you, by worrying, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? Therefore, you cannot do anything. Rather, if you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not seek what you uh, will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your father knows the things, uh, rather, your father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom. And these things will be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for your father is well pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give it as charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes uh, near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Gird up your loins. And keep your lamps lit. And be like men who are waiting for their masters when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may <clears throat> excuse me, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, that he will guard himself to serve, and to have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. I have uh A lot of friends, and even yesterday, uh, people were asking on Twitter um, about the importance of eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the end times, the last things. It's when Jesus will return. And it used to be, 
or a lot of the churches we were members of, that this was the preeminent thing. They had it in their statement of faith. It was so important for them. Um, they were hardcore, uh, pre-millennial, pre-trib, dispensationalist churches. Um, if, if you took the theology of the Left Behind series and extracted it and poured it into a church, these were the churches we attended. And as I call it, the um, Left Behindism. And they were so focused on the, on the end times. And it's a good thing to be focused on that, to know that it is coming and it will come at some point. And it's super important to know that because that drives your, your desire to preach the gospel. It's what gives your, your uh, gospel call an urgency because you're worried because they may not live until tomorrow. In fact, there's a great... Um, was it Spurgeon or Moody? I think it was Moody. D.L. Moody was preaching. Um, and he was, um, I'm kind of thinking it was Spurgeon. Doesn't matter. Anyway, one of the two were preaching. And they, they brought um, their message to the people, right? Uh, and with, with immediacy and urgency and everything else. And as they were leaving, he said, uh, well, they were asking, well, what, 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 what comes next? He says, don't worry, next week I'll give you the rest of the story, which is the gospel he was going to prepare for them. So he built them up for it with the idea that the next week he was going to unleash it for them. But in that week's time, a fire broke out in the city and killed many of the people who were in attendance. So he swore never again to um, stop from preaching the gospel to the people. So, the same type of thing pushes somebody who believes that Jesus is going to come back any minute now. Which is true. He could show up right now as I'm speaking. Or maybe in 10 minutes. Maybe in an hour. Or maybe in a month or a year or 10 years or a thousand years. Jesus will come back when he comes back. Jesus himself didn't even know when he was going to return. He said it's up to the Father to determine when he comes back. So what are we to be doing in the meantime? The work of God. And this is all dialing back to that thing I mentioned before about, about um, the urgency with which we view eschatology. This is the point being made here in this text. We need to be urgent in our gospel proclamation. Scripture's clear. Today is the day of salvation. That doesn't mean that it's, it's only today when you first heard it and were saved, and now it's no longer the day of salvation. Today is always permanently today. And that is the right day for salvation for someone whose heart has been, has been touched by the Holy Spirit, who has been brought to um, spiritual birth, where they're finally calling out to God, asking for forgiveness and trusting in him alone for their salvation. That day is always today. But it's our eschatology that determines, uh, for, for a lot of those things, the urgency of our gospel presentation. If you're post-millennial, or perhaps pre-millennial, or even amillennial as I am, it, it really kind of changes your view of how things are going to be. Me, as an amillennialist, I look at the world in the way that it's constantly warring against God and attacking God in every possible way. And yes, absolutely, I see, I see wins every day where you know, we see good things that are coming up for God, and then I see horrible things that are happening. People turning against God and turning against God's children. And I see these things happening continually. So for me, as an amillennialist, I understand things are going to get a lot worse before Jesus comes back. As a post-millennialist, uh, people believe that things will typically get better. Now, both post-millennialism and amillennialism, which we're not going to go into whole detail on that now, but they both 
kind of meet together at the same point. That's that when Jesus returns, he's going to take all of the wicked people from the earth and get them out. This is what differs from, uh, from premillennialism and dispensationalism. The pre-trib, pre-mill, dispensationalist idea is that God will secretly, Jesus will secretly sneak in in the middle of the night and steal away his people and flee with them to heaven. And then there's a whole thing about the three and a half years and seven years, and they, they pull a lot of uh, uh, ideas out of uh, the book of Daniel and mix it with some Zechariah and a little bit of um, uh, First and Second Thessalonians, and then they uh, swirl it around in, in, in the book of Revelation, and they kind of spit out something that's just confusing as all get out. I know this is somebody who was really into that for a long time. As I said before, these are all views. These are all views of what's going to happen in the end time. When Jesus finally comes back. And the text here is pointing to what we, as good Christian soldiers, should be doing. Blessed are those slaves, which is what we are whom the master will find awake, as in focused, attending to the things that they should be working on, which is serving God and taking care of those in the church and taking care of those outside the church, three things in order. Truly, I say to you that the master, Jesus the Christ, will gird himself to serve them. And have them recline at table and will come up and wait on them. One who spoke and the universe burst into existence. He will serve us. Not that we deserve it. But because he's the first of all. Means he's servant of all. Whether he comes in the second watch or in the third and, and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. This is what we should be doing. Paul Washer makes a great point about this. He doesn't really care what is going to happen when Jesus returns. He just wants to be sure that he's found doing the work of God when Jesus comes. Verse 39, but be sure of this. That if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now Peter said, Lord, are, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, well, who then is the faithful and prudent steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants uh, to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his fine, uh, sorry, who's a, ah, starting over, verse 43. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming, begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, well, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Seems like he's shifting his view from a guy who just has him, you know, serving in his house. And now he's talking about taking this person and cutting him into pieces and casting him out with the unbelievers. That's the unconverted. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many beatings. Now, this is a different person. All right, this is one who, who is well-versed in Scripture, who understands the things of God, right? But he's just not doing anything with what he's been given. He will receive many beatings, but the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a beating, will receive but a few. 
from everyone who has uh, been given much, much will be required, and to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. But I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is finished. Do you think that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, a father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, remember where they are, right? The west would mean it would be over the Mediterranean Sea. Immediately, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it happens. This, uh, clouds come up from the, um, uh, from the Mediterranean Sea. They're heavy laden with water that they've accumulated over the sea. They come to the land and they deposit it, Right? And when you see a south wind blowing that's coming up from the desert, you say, well, it will be a hot day, and it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to examine the appearance of the earth and of the sky, but you do not know how to examine this present time. What he's telling them is that every sign that they need is available to them now. And why do you not even judge for yourselves what is right? For while you are arguing with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, on your way there, make an effort uh, to, to, to settle with him, so that he may not drag you before the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you in prison. I say to you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the very last lepton, or penny, basically. Let's move on to Job chapter 27. Then Job continued to lift up his discourse and said, As God lives, who has removed my justice, and the Almighty who has embittered my soul. And he's not expressly blaming God for what happens. But this is where he's getting kind of the most, um, that's a good way to put it. Um, he's, He's getting the most accusatory against God. He's not blaming God for what's happening, but he is saying uh, that it's um, that what's happening to me is the result of God working against me, right? He's not saying that God is wrong in anything he's done. He's just saying this is what's happened. Verse 3, for as long as breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips certainly will not speak unrighteousness, nor will my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should declare you right. This is him talking to his friends now, because his friends are accusing him of all manner of evil things. But as I said before, I think that they were sent by Satan to tempt him to, or rather to goad him into lying about what, uh, what, what's happening to him, as though he had done something wrong. Because if he does that, well, then he's lying, and then he's no longer right in the eyes of God. But here he says, verse 4, I will not speak unrighteousness, nor let my tongue utter deceit. Far be it for me that I should declare declare you right. Till I breathe my last, I will not remove my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach any of my days. May my enemy be as the wicked. And the one who rises up against uh, me as the unjust. For what is the hope of the godless when he is cut off? When God requires his soul? Will God hear his cry? When distress comes upon him? Will he take delight in the Almighty? Will he call on God at all times? I will instruct you in the power of God. What is with the Almighty, I will not conceal. Behold, all of you have seen it. Why then do you speak with utter vanity? 
This is the portion of a wicked man from God, and the inheritance which the ruthless receive from the Almighty. Though his sons are many, they are destined for the sword, and his offspring will not be satisfied with bread. His survivors will be buried because of the plague, and their widows will not be able to weep. So he piles up silver like dust and prepares garments as plentiful as the clay. He may prepare it, but the righteous, the righteous will wear it, and the innocent will divide the silver. He has built his house like uh, like, like the moth, or, or as a hut which the watchman has made. He lies down rich, but never again. He opens his eyes, and it is no longer. Terrors overtake him like many waters. A tempest steals him away in the night. The east wind carries him away, and he goes. It whirls him away from his place. For it will hurl at him without sparing. He will surely try to flee from its power. Men will clap their hands at him and will hiss, uh, rather, and will hiss him from his place. Go ahead and move on to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. (sighs) Okay. So, Paul has been building to this for a while. We all know. 1 Corinthians 13. Everybody loves to say it at, at weddings and it's, you know, and, and around, um, around Valentine's Day, you'll always kind of find it, you know, uh, stuffed into, um, you know, horrible packages of, of chocolates or something. You know, people c- pulling from this as if, you know, they found some sort of massive tome to tell them about true love and, and what have you. This has almost nothing at all to do with marital love. It has almost nothing at all to do with um, really marriage at all. Aside from the fact that a marriage is a, a partnership that's built on unity. And unity is the theme of this entire letter to the Corinthians. He opens Corinthians by first acknowledging that there that, that the first thing that he was told about is that there are divisions arising up among the people. That some people are are, are saying that they are uh, holier than the others because they simply have uh, heard the gospel from one person or another. As if hearing the gospel through a specific person uh, makes you somehow a better Christian. We see the same thing today with people who have favorite pastors, internet pastors, for instance, or or authors that they swear by. Oh, I was a member at John MacArthur's church. I went to John Piper's church. I got to meet Paul Washer. I shook the hand. Kirk Cameron. What does this have to do with anything? Nothing at all. It's the same gospel that we preach. It's the same God who saves us. It's the same Holy Spirit who lives within each one of us. How does one person claim any sort of authority or or fame compared to another person simply because they heard some message given to them? Then it goes deeper. We see that the people in the last chapter are are comparing one against another based on whatever gift they had received from the Holy Spirit. Here's a neat thing. If you receive a gift and someone next to you receives a, a lesser gift in your eyes, can you laud it over that person because you think you received a better gift? What did you what did you do to earn that gift? Nothing. What if the person next to you received, in your eyes, what's a better gift than yours? Well, what do you do with your gift? Put it away. Don't tell anybody about that. I I received a horrible gift. 
It's not like I'm able to speak in tongues. Jimmy, he can heal people. But is it Jimmy who's doing the healing? No. It's God who's doing the healing through him. He's just a tool. He's a vessel that God has chosen, just like you. But this church was warring within itself and tearing itself apart because of these stupid things that they were lab uh, uh, labeling each other with. They built a hierarchy based on gifts that were given to specific people. It's pure idiocy. His whole point in this letter is unity. Unity, unity, unity. We in the church should be building upon unity with one another. Those who are Christians should understand that what you have, you merely received. You didn't earn it. It wasn't because God saw in you some spark of the divine, and therefore he's given you all of these extra things. No. God gave you a specific gift to use it. If your gift is tongues, which probably doesn't even exist today. We know what tongues are from reading in Acts chapter 2. And tongues are nothing more than regular languages spoken in that region by those people. It's like today, if, if um, I was sent to, to Montreal for work or something. And I don't speak a lick of French. All the French I know is French fries and that's it. So if I go to Montreal, and if I'm sitting there talking with a guy, and for some reason, you know, Jesus prompts me, my Holy Spirit within me, prompts me to start talking about gospel things. And I give him the law, and I give him the gospel, and we talk, and we shake hands, and we walk away. And someone comes over next to me and says, man, I didn't know you spoke French. I'm like, what? I have no idea how any, uh, t t seriously, I, I, I don't even know how to count in French. He says, but you were just talking French with that guy in, in perfect French. No, I wasn't. That's speaking in tongues. It's always done for a specific purpose. Tongues were given in order to spread the gospel, not so people could lord it over, them, uh, over other people who don't have that ability. It was always given with the ability for interpretation. Why? Because with interpretation, the things that are being said can be rendered to more people. If I, for instance, only knew German and you didn't know German, and I'm, or, or even now, I'm speaking this in English, right? And if you only understand German, you come to my... Um, uh, website to, to, to view this through whatever method you watch it on, BitChute or, or Odyssey or YouTube or whatever, Rumble. If you come to one of those pages and you view this and you don't understand any of the words, well, what's the point of any of it? So the gift of tongues always had an interpreter. That's somebody who could explain it for the people. We were members at a church where speaking in tongues was a common thing. In fact, they said that they really believed that there were two different levels. Now, we didn't believe this. We, they allowed us to be members there, even though we didn't agree with them on this one thing, because we weren't going to make a stink about it. But they said that there's really two levels of Christianity. There's those who are Christians. Yes, that's true. Oh, everybody's Christian. That's good for you, Christian. But then there's those who can speak in tongues. That's the second filling of the Spirit. This is what allows them to be a higher level Christian. They were doing the same thing the Corinthians did. Separating on, on the basis of gifts. And even then, none of them could interpret. As we're going to go into in the next chapter, in chapter 14, it stated how church should be done within the church service. Or how the worship should go. And yeah, absolutely, it has a point in there that, yeah, if anybody has something to say that they speak in a tongue, then great. But there should be interpretation or let them be quiet. 
Every single time they opened up the mic for someone to come up and give some sort of word. It was either some prophetic thing where, you know, Jimmy was a different Jimmy, obviously, uh, was um, basically condemning the entire place. You know, God told me he's going to burn this building down and we're going to, you know, there, there's going to be a, 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 a Biscuitville here in six months because of the, the horrible sin of all the people. And that never happened. Of course, we didn't follow up with what's supposed to happen when a uh, prophet of God says, thus says the Lord, and it doesn't come through. But I don't think anybody wanted to stone them. Anyway. But we were supposed to have interpretation for any of those things. And every single time someone would go up and, 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 and say whatever it is that they were saying, some sort of... What's a good way to put this? Um... The nicest way I could put it is some sort of rambling, babbling, something noise. It sounded like some sort of language, kind of. Every once in a while, someone would step up and you'd be like, is that a real language? It sounds like, you know, a normal language would sound, but the rest were just, it's, you know, uh, something you would hear a child, like a baby, kind of babbling, right? But there was never interpretation. There was only once that interpretation was, was offered. And the pastor started with, I think what they're trying to say is no. If it's true interpretation, it is they said this. None of that happened. Yet they were still doing the same thing this Corinthian church was doing. So Paul's whole point in all of this is it is utterly ridiculous for someone to come along and say, oh, well, I'm a better Christian than you. I have the gift of administration, which honestly, in my mind, is probably one of the best gifts of all. Being able to handle all of the finance stuff for church, make sure things get done, because I don't have a mind for that. Those are the good things. The, the things that people typically don't want. But all of these gifts were being battled about inside the church. And this is what he's directly addressing. So he opens with a bit of hyperbole. Where he's, he's saying... The most ridiculous things amaze, sorry, uh, 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 that he could possibly say. And this is something else that people get hung up on. Then after that, he describes what love actually is. By contrast, and given the way he's saying it, you could almost uh, picture that the Corinthians were the exact opposite of all of the things that he says. And that's Basically, verses um, 4 through 7. He redefines it for us in verse 8. And then he concludes in 9 through 13. Let's begin. I'm going to roll back one verse here. Paul, concluding his section directly on the, on the spiritual gifts, is primer to this. He begins in verse 31, but you earnestly desire the greater gifts or the higher gifts, right? This doesn't mean speaking in tongues. It means those um, that allow you to serve the church more directly. In verse, uh, let me see here, what is it? Uh, 28, he goes through a list. God has appointed in the church first apostles. Second, prophets. Well, third, teachers. Then miracles. That comes after teaching. Then gifts of healing. Then helps and administrations. And then various kinds of tongues. That's the last of all. And he's telling them to desire the greater gifts, which are those. Those are the ones that allow you to serve others within the church itself. And I will yet show you a more excellent way. Verse 1, 
If I speak with the tongues of men and, and of angels, the tongues of angels, right? So if I, if, I, if I spoke all the languages of humans and all the languages in heaven, right? hyperbole, he's showing every possible thing. But do not have love. I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Basically, it's useless. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to, to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. And this is the stuff that they are not. Love is kind. It is not jealous. It does not brag, is not puffed up. It does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own, is not provoked, and it does not take, an account, take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. That means that you're coming together to help support people. Believes all things. Hopes all things and endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, well, they will cease. And if there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child. I used to think like a child, reason like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will be fully known, or rather I will know fully just as I have been fully known. But now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now this part gets confusing for a lot of people. So I'm going to go over some of this very quickly for you. The point where he says that um, in when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. These three things that are given to us, and this is something that Calvin himself affirms. Uh, stated in, in chapter 8 here, prophecy, um, knowledge, and tongues. These are all things that are given to us so that we have something to kind of rely on in our Christian walk. Remember what, he had, what, what Paul had already said to these same people, that they are um, not yet mature in their faith. They are as children, Right? He can't talk to them about, about the deeper things yet because the deeper things they're not prepared for. They can't handle them. So, yeah, prophecy is required for them. The spiritual gift of knowledge is something that they need to have now. But once they're with Christ, they don't need it at all. But if you notice here, it says prophecy and knowledge are the two that will be done away but tongues, as stated, will cease. Literally, it will end. That's a, he could have said done away, but he didn't. He chose a different word for a reason. Speaking in tongues will cease because eventually we'll have been able to speak the gospel to all people. Everybody at some point will have a common language with which to share the gospel. It's only necessary if you're speaking to somebody in a language that you don't share a common language, so it's harder for you to preach the gospel to them, to tell them the things of God, to help to, to, to disciple these people. But once you share a common language, you don't have to have that anymore, do you? But prophecy, knowledge, these are things that people use to kind of hold themselves to the faith for a bit. But eventually you learn to trust in the finished work of Christ as stated through Scripture. The more you trust in God, the more you um, let your full weight kind of 
hang in the promises of God. And once you have that, you have no need of prophecy or knowledge. Because your faith is what carries you and keeps you afloat. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, and reason like a child. But when I became mature, when I became a man, I did away with these childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. The last line here, but now abide. Abide means to live and remain. Faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Why? Because when Christ returns, our faith that he will return is unnecessary. Our hope that Jesus will return will go away. Why? Because he's here. But what's the one that will continue and remain? Love. So he's telling them, focus more on love than on all of the other gifts and everything else. And all of these things will work themselves out. All right. That is all the text and that is also all the notes. Um, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.